I disappear for a moment with better lighting. Okay, Mr. Marshall, you are co-host. We are recording. Amherst Media is here. Um, you have a quorum and it's 634. You're good to go. Okay, thank you, Pam. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of January 4th, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 635 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022 and extended again by the State Legislature on July 16th, 2022, this Planning Board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda, posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so, for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively and return to mute. Bruce Colden. I'm here. Thank you, Bruce. Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. I, Doug Marshall, and present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Here. And we have been advised that Karen Winter will be absent this evening. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. General, uh, for the public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, board members. Uh, our first item this evening uh, for, for is uh, the minutes and we have the December 7th minutes available for uh, review and discussion and hopefully approval. Uh, any board members, uh, do you have comments on the minutes that you wish to make? Okay, barring any comments, and I see no raised hands, uh, would anyone like to make a motion to uh, adopt the minutes as drafted by uh, our staff this evening? Hi, Tom. So moved. Thank you, Tom. Anybody want to second that? Johanna? I'll second. Okay, thank you, Johanna. Board members, any additional 
Any comments you want to make? This is another second chance. Okay, we'll go right into our roll call vote. Bruce, we'll start with you. Uh, I approve. All right, Tom. I approve. Andrew. Abstain. Okay. Uh, Janet. Abstain. All right. Johanna. Approve. And I will approve as well. Uh, that, that vote is four in favor, two abstentions, and one absent. Chris, I trust that is, that's enough of a majority to adopt the minutes? Yes, thank you. Yes, good, thank you. All right, so, uh, members of the public, we will now go to the general public comment period. And as I said in the intro, this is the time for you to make comments about items that are not on tonight's agenda. So uh, if you want to speak about anything other than the project on Belchertown Road that we will be discussing later, this is the time to do it. Are there any members of the public that would like to make a comment? Okay, I don't see any raised hands. Right, hands raised. Um, I will, as I've done lately on at meetings, uh, now list that we have, or mention that we have seven attendees. Uh, one is Amherst Media. We have uh, Bruce Allen, Connor Burgess from ServiceNet, Pat, Pat Nude, Ryan Nelson, Tom Miranda, and uh, probably Elizabeth Beerling. Uh, most of those folks are here for the Belchertown project, I believe. All right, with that, we'll go on to the next item on our agenda. Item three, which is our continued public hearing uh, with a site plan review. So the time now is 641. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this joint public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard, to be heard regarding SPR 2023-02, ServiceNet Incorporated at 10, 12, and 22 Belchertown Road. This hearing is continued from December 7th of 2022. Public hearing to request site plan approval to renovate the existing building and provide 12 efficiency apartment units for transitional housing, <clears throat> excuse me, with office space for associated staff. Site improvements include resurfacing and striping of existing parking, 39 spaces, including two handicapped accessible spaces, demo of one building entrance, and the installation of new pedestrian access walkways and new doors and windows in the building. Located on map 15C, parcel 19, and parcel 2-19, as well as map 15A, parcel 43, are both in the COM commercial zoning district. Uh, do we have any board member disclosures? I do not see any hands. All right, so uh, as I said, this hearing is continued from December 7th. So welcome back to the team for ServiceNet. Uh, Mr. Miranda, do you want to introduce the presentation tonight or should we go right to Nelson, to, to Ryan? Uh, you are muted. Uh, Chris, I do see your hand. I just wanted to mention that we did re-advertise this project because um, when we had first advertised it before the December 7th date, um, we noticed afterwards that the listing of the parcel number was wrong. It was wrong on the application. So we added um, all three parcels and we re-advertised it. And we sent abutters notices to all the abutters within 300 feet of those three parcels. Um, I would still consider this a continued public hearing, but when we publish the decision, we will um, make clear that we've um, that we started it on December 7th, but now we have re-advertised it and to a broader audience. And now we're continuing the public hearing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chris. 
Mr. Miranda, sorry for the interruption. Uh, no problem. Yes, Mr. Nelson will, Mr. Nelson. Okay. Sure, hello everyone. Ryan Nelson from R. Lebeck Associates representing ServiceNet for this project. I'm gonna to attempt to share my screen here. <clears throat> so we've taken into account a lot of the feedback from our last meeting. Uh, one of that was there was some concern over kind of the clarity of the plan. It was very busy, a lot going on. So we've broken down uh, the plan set into another sheet. We've added a second sheet that kind of details uh, more of the technicalities up close of grading and the, the parking and the ramps and landscaping. But let me go back to the first sheet, the overall site. Um, <clears throat> we have added an open space uh, lot coverage calculation table to the plan. And we have incorporated the conversion of the a portion of the existing parking lot uh, to green space. So if you look at this green hatched area that is currently parking that will be turned into a, uh, a lawn area for the residents. So that <clears throat> conversion uh, reduces the overall lot coverage for the site. And then we're also incorporating those Conservation Commission requested mitigation along the, the stream. Um, <clears throat> we've also added plantings as screening along the southern side of the parking area to help uh, screen residents against that southerly property, which uh, I believe is a gas station. We uh, had some correspondence with the town uh, DPW regarding the curb cut and they were in support of keeping the curb cut as it was if we could demonstrate the need for it. Um, I sent over earlier today kind of a, a turning diagram uh, for a bus that showed that uh, northbound vehicles uh, would need that width of a curb cut in order to safely get into the site without having to make a wide swing into Beltertown Road. Um, we have added a proposed dump, dumpster enclosure that would be located here on the west side of the building within the existing parking area. We will have a fenced enclosure and we do have a detail of that included on sheet four of our plan set. Um, same as before, these striped areas are uh, just to further clarify the no parking areas right now. The striping isn't well defined, so all striping will be more clearly defined as part of this project. Um, as Christine said, there was some confusion over the parcels. Uh, they're referenced as units in the master deed. So we have units one, two, and three. So this project is uh, consists of just dedicating or focusing on unit one. And we've added those demarcation lines from the master deed onto our site plan. So you can see this dark black dashed line. That's the boundary between unit one and unit two. And then over here, this dark black uh, dash line is, is the uh, boundary between unit one and unit three. So our calculation and the lot coverage table focuses on just unit one in this case. Um, <clears throat> let's see, what else? Go to sheet two. Um, it just provides further detail on the spot grades of the handicap walks. We've added uh, railings to both sides of the individual staircases servicing the units. Uh, we're proposing um, emerald green arborvitaes along the southern side of the parking for screening. There's a total of roughly 16 of them uh, listed on the planting table. And then we have added um, on our detail sheet, I believe on the last page, a uh, typical detail of a, a railing along the staircase, as well as that dumpster uh, enclosure detail. We've also provided uh, further detail on the proposed windows and siding and gutters for the renovations. I forwarded those over earlier. Um, I'll just peruse through some of these. So the windows and the siding will be white trim. Uh, I was told by the builder. Uh, there'd be no, no um, reconfigurations to the roof aside from the demo of that building entrance on the Eastern side. Uh, Mr. Nelson, I noticed these sure. windows in this image, some of them have uh, divided lights. Some of them have the upper light only divided into six units. Some of them have both upper and lower lights divided. Um, 
Maybe it's shown on the architectural elevations that received that arrived this afternoon. Uh, but uh, how how are you articulating the windows? Uh, that's a good question. I would have to clarify with the the builder on that. Um, our architect for the the project is currently out. He had immediate death in his family, so he's unable to join us tonight. Um, so I'm I'm unsure of the answer to that. Okay, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No problem. And it has been noted on updated architectural elevations, um, the siding and what windows will be replaced, and the um, the decking. The ramps and the uh, deck around the entrance will be pressure treated lumber um, based on uh, information the builder had given me. Go back. So here is the updated archi architectural plan. This shows um, the existing main entrance that will be utilized. And then there was a, there will, currently is a second entrance over here to the east that will be demoed and this is what it will look like with the new um, doorways to those individual dwelling units and there's the back side of the building so that would be the north side facing um, unit three of the property and then this would be looking from belcher town road looking at the side of the building um, there's the bulkhead, there's the main entrance porch overhang area. And am I right that the dumpster would be right up against that west elevation? Correct, yes. It would be uh, just north of the bulkhead area. Yep. And then here we have our interior uh, first, floor, first floor plan. The ramp would be located over here. Uh, this is the existing porch at the front entrance. It'd be a, a new modified sidewalk running along the front side of the building with individual staircases to each unit shown here. Um, just give me one second, check my notes. I think that covers all of these site changes that were made. Um, happy to answer any questions that the board may still have um, and any operational questions perhaps ServiceNet can provide. All right, thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, Chris, I just wanted to start with one question for you. Uh, is it appropriate for a, a, a site like this that's been divided into three condo units to do the uh, calculations for lot coverage and such based on only the one unit? Normally we would have the whole site shown and the calculations would be done for the whole site. Um, since the building isn't changing <clears throat> and the lot coverage is actually being reduced, we felt that it wasn't necessary to have the whole site shown for that reason. Um, if there had been a, an upward, you know, uh, increase in building or lot coverage, I think that it would have been necessary to show the whole site. But given the fact that lot coverage is being reduced and building coverage isn't changing, we felt that this was adequate. Okay, thank you. All right, board members, um, a lot of this material, or it looks like a lot of material came in this afternoon. Um, I don't know about you, but I really didn't have a chance to look at it before our meeting. Um, I guess uh, we will need to decide whether we want to uh, vote on this project tonight or whether we want to take some time and, and, uh, and digest the information that came in pretty recently. Uh, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Uh, and thanks for the presentation, Ryan. Yeah, I, I would uh, agree, Doug. I, I'm just getting caught up on this stuff as well. But that said, I did have a question about the, the planting plan. And you mentioned those 16 new arborvitaes. Um, I guess I'm wondering, had you, what is, uh, seeing that you sort of car, carve out and leave this space sort of unaccounted for, if you can see that on my screen, 
I'm wondering if if you would consider maybe you know revising the the hedge wall or the arbor vitae wall a little bit to to claim some of that space for your users, uh, for your residents. Um, if not, I'm just curious, what's your plan for the that triangular swath on the other side of the Arborvitaes? All right, Mr. Nelson. Sure, so right now that whole area is just grassed. Um, based on the feedback last meeting, we, we kind of, one of the reasons why we converted this existing parking over here to grass was for the residents thinking that they would use this area instead. Um, okay. Yes, I mean, we, it's it's yeah just i wasn't on the last meeting so i'm trying to get caught up on some of that as oh, well okay yep um no you know, it might also i guess just to it might be worth pushing that tree line back also just for general snow removal and so forth it would provide some area for you to push push snow up against if need be and then i was curious also then the um is this is that green space driven by CONCOM, by P, by planning board, or because when I visited the site, one of the things that I thought might be interesting is um, would be to actually would actually be to green up, and I don't know if you guys can follow what I'm doing here, but would be to free up some parking spaces so there'd actually be green space right outside of your front door. Um, if if CONCOM said, look, we want to have this protected given its proximity to the water, totally fine. But if this was just you know a method of um, giving up five or six parking spaces, I'd be curious to know whether you know anyone on the board would also be interested in, in seeing some of that shift to provide green space in front of the, the, the residents' entrances. Yeah, uh, Andrew, that was um, a, a combination of kind of both reviewing parties, CONCOM and planning board. So uh, at the last planning board meeting, there was um, a suggestion to convert some of the unnecessary excess pavement into a green space to reduce the lot coverage. And conservation was looking for mitigation near the stream area. So that's why we cited it uh, ad immediately adjacent to the head wall of that stream. Um, we, we have reduced parking by uh, quite a few number of spaces. So we'd be hesitant to remove any further additional uh, spaces, you know, in case the building, you know, things change over the years. If ServiceNet ever wanted to sell the building, or it was changed in use, we don't want to be deficient in parking. Okay. And then if I could ask you one final one, Doug, if you don't mind, is just All right ahead. Uh, the Ar <laughs> it just for those arborvitaes is um what's what's the, the kind of maintenance plan for those? They can, you know, get to be extremely large and and you know an imposing element in the landscape. Um just wondering is the plan to keep those trimmed to a certain height? Is it uh you know, how do you how do you uh, propose managing that? Um, so the idea of planting them is for screening. So uh, a barrier is is the is the goal. Whether how high they get, um, I'm open to any uh, limitations the planning board might set. Otherwise, I guess it would be up to uh, personal preference with ServiceNet and their grounds crew. Okay, Andrew, yeah, I, I, I have to go back out and take a look to to provide any more feedback on that. Is that an appropriate species? Would you want to consider something that was smaller at full height? I think it's effective. I mean, it's a very effective screening mechanism. Were you asking? I'm sorry, were you asking me? To... Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it's a very effective screening plant. Um, I, you know, I know there are various, um, there are various varieties of arborvitae which have, you know, different heights. I think, you know, if this, um, I think arborvitae could work, but personally, I think we'd want to try to maintain or limit the height on it. And additionally, if you're going to do that, that sort of opens up to, to you know, putting some other type of buffer plant in front of it to, to eliminate this sort of imposed in green wall. So. Okay. Uh, Mr. Miranda, I, I see your hand up and since you're the applicant, I'll let you go next. Okay, am you I are unmuted? I am. You are. I can hear you. Okay, very good. So I just wanted to bring uh, to everyone's attention. Last time uh, there was discussion about the the guardrail at the northwest corner of the property, and uh, 
that that guardrail is entirely on the exclusive use area of unit three. So that is not on unit one. And so we don't have any control over that guardrail if that, because that was a question I believe that uh, some members had last time. And uh, just commenting on the uh, Andrew's uh, suggestion with regard to moving the uh, Arborvitae more along the perimeter of the property, that certainly seems uh, feasible. I think that the height of the Arborvitae uh, depends on the species, as someone mentioned, and it also is, um, I think, is a matter of of uh, personal preference as to how high uh, they should be allowed to grow. Uh, so uh, I just throw that out. I, uh, and I'm not certainly not an expert uh, in these, but my understanding is that there are arborvitae that do have a limit of, uh, of 30 to 35 feet, which uh, in my mind is uh, Uh, you've dropped out, uh, Tom. I'm not sure what happened. You, we just yeah. lost. We just lost the audio when you were talking about 30 to 35 feet. My back. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yes, it seems to be cutting out on my end also. The and so I think it's a matter of personal preference. Uh, aesthetic wise, I think that the 30 to 35 feet for the size of this property and what's in the immediate environs of the property to me would be an appropriate uh, height for um, that type of a screening. So now, would you be now, okay yeah, with yeah. us setting a limit to the height of that planting, putting it in the management plan or something like that, or a condition? I'll defer to Connor on that, uh, but it, it seems that you can buy, uh, there are species that are um, uh, that are staying right. to grow to, yep. that, to that particular height. Right. I, I can add to that. The species we've picked is an emerald green arborvitae, and they have a max height of around 15 feet. Oh, okay. 15, you said, right? Correct. Okay. So, Tom or uh, Andrew, that doesn't seem very tall. Uh, all right, no, 15 is great. I know they, they can, in the wild, be 40, 50 feet. Um, so yeah, 15 seems appropriate. And also that's, you know, that's the, the Southern exposure and, um, you know, let make sure we get nice light into the, uh, into the development as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, you're next. Um, thank you. I, I, I want to, uh, support everything that Andrew uh, said and then the conversation that, uh, concluded with the 15 feet high. I, I, I certainly uh, want the uh, would like those trees to stay at that height because otherwise they're going to be shading the limited amount of uh, green space that's uh, uh, that, that that is behind them. So I think 15 is a good height. Um, I, uh, I, I, I applaud ServiceNet for creating that uh, green space at the eastern end here. Um, I I guess it will serve the function of uh, very, very, very effectively of being a place where snow can accumulate because uh, it's right at the end of the push. So that's another good reason for it there. I'm sure that's part of the plan, but it, uh, it's, 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 a, <coughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I think it's a very constructive uh, addition. I support both of Andrew's uh, suggestions, uh, the, 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 the idea of pulling the trees back um, to creating that triangle that's more accessible to the property rather than walling it off. I think that's an excellent suggestion of Andrew's. I would encourage the applicant to, to, uh, to, to do as Andrew suggests. Um, I also think that that suggestion, which has already been refuted by the applicant and, and this is their right, of course, but I think uh, the half dozen parking spaces that Andrew suggested right outside the entry, uh, right outside the units that could be uh, added to the green space would be a really constructive addition. I, I understand that they may future, uh, there may be a, the desire to have them uh, as future parking spaces, but any new owner would 
be able to spend a, a fairly small amount of money to reclaim them as parking. So I don't think it's really a, a, a problem for the future. And I, 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 I can't understand why you wouldn't say we've got an immediate need for these for our use and, uh, and then keeping uh, imagining that you're uh, keeping them for some unidentified potential possible future uh, benefits seems to me um, uh, I don't understand that so I would encourage you to uh, think uh, seriously of, 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 of taking Andrew's suggestion um, I would support that I just wanted to say that um, um, a couple a couple of other things if I may the the hatching that's uh, particularly up in the western uh, lot there, there's um, the, there's defined parking areas, and then there's this hatching. I thought at first that it was going to be uh, grass, uh, green space, or so, uh, but but I'm not sure that that's the case. It says, uh, um, but I don't. Is, what is that uh, surface? That is currently pavement. Um, that would continue to be pavement. That's that's what we're proposing. So, would there be curb stops at the end of the parking spaces, uh, particularly the ones that are angled up and to the right? Uh, we weren't showing them. There is a guardrail uh, along that side, but we could add curb stops. Yes. Well, just in terms of management of parking, I would. You know, there's nothing to keep people from driving all over that striped area. Is it actually going to be painted striped or is that just a, a graphic convenience on the plan? It would be painted striped. Okay, it's just that those stripes are not parallel to the striping uh, that delineates the uh, parking areas. So, uh, so I understand that you would paint the striping between the parking spaces, but I'm talking about the hatching in the uh, area of the property that is not designated for parking, but I guess I understand is still going to be paved. It's it's uh, it just seems a bit odd. I can't understand that there's striping uh, that describes where the parking is. Is, is it going to be like uh, yellow hatching that you have on the highway where you're not supposed to drive? It, it could be, I, I'm not sure of the color, but um, we can certainly utilize striping or curb stops, whatever the board prefers. Okay. Hey, Bruce, uh, you know how usually when you've got two handicapped parking spaces, one's a van unit? Yep. And there's a six foot gap between them where no one can park. Usually there's striping in that zone. Yeah. But it's at a 45 degree angle. Yeah from the orientation of the parking. So if we, uh, so let's assume that that's what's intended here. And uh, it, although it's not uh, clearly shown on the drawings and it's also not noted on the drawing, it could be, but I, I would say let's assume or let's not assume, let's condition or let's expect that what Doug just said is the way these non-parking paved areas are treated. Does that seem reasonable? It's a question for the applicant. Yes, Mr. Nelson. Uh, we it, are you saying to convert those to non-paved areas? No. Well, I I don't think Bruce has said that yet. Uh, <laughs> although I think all, uh, many of us would prefer that. Um, I think Bruce. Uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think are you troubled by the rather odd angled relationship between the striping shown and the parking space orientation? Yes, it doesn't, it, the drawing doesn't communicate to me uh, anything that I understand that would happen there. But I think the way Doug described it, that that, that would be diagonally striped as it were, as if it were the, uh, um, the, the, the uh, set down space between uh, accessible parking. Uh, that would be fine. Um, so that would uh, that would be Ryan to basically reorient the direction of the stripes so that they are forty five degrees off of the of the lines between spaces. Okay. Yep. That's an easy fix. 
Sure. Yeah. Unless you'd prefer to uh, dig it up and plant uh, grass there, which is, I think we all would say would be preferred, but we understand that you're reluctant to, I think I understand that you're reluctant to do that. Um, finally, uh, the, the, I have a question related to what I see, or what I, I, I seems to be an inconsistency between the site plan and the, uh, and, and the architectural plan. So if you could zoom out a little on the current plan, um, I'm not sure who's, who's in control of this. Now I'm looking at the three doorways at the, the, uh, at the Western units, the three units that are at the Western end. Um, and uh, it seems that we have a, a concrete, um well there's the ramp yes there's a there's a ramp that uh, where your hand is and then it turns around and it's a horizontal uh, slab against the building and Correct. we have the doors that's what's this, this that's what this plan communicates but then if you go to the the plan the architectural plan uh go down to the plan ryan yeah, there. Yeah. Now you've got three separate landings. It looks different. Yes. So uh, that was a revision we had requested from the architect. Um, not sure what got lost in translation, but I do know um, he has been sick and then also out with um, you know the death in his family. So we were unable to get that that area revised. But what it should show is a horizontal you know landing that runs along all three of those units. And that would be on the back side of the ramp. Um, so uh, do we, do I therefore correctly understand that the site plan is the accurate Correct. Uh, rendition? Yes. And uh, so we, we will therefore, as we look at these drawings, we will understand that this area of the architectural plan should reflect the site plan, should reflect what is shown on the site plan. Correct, yes. Okay. Doug, I think I'm done for, oh, I guess there's one other observation that I have, and that is that it appears in the, in the conversation last time, the, uh, the, 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 the waste management strategy was uh, to have the, uh, the there was a, a, a enclosure on the north side of the building, and you were going to provide access to that through the building. Um, now I see there is a, an exterior um dumpster enclosure which is a whole lot smaller than what is on the other side um do we correctly understand that the dumpster enclosure on the north side of the building is something that you will not have any uh use for that there's going to be no access to that dumpster enclosure from inside the building um basically people are going to um from the apartments or from the, uh, the, the the single room occupancies, they're going to come out their front doors and walk around uh, and then put their trash in the dumpster. And that is the full and, uh, and total uh, trash uh, management um, facility for the whole of your service net uh, uh, facility. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. The service okay. net facility will be using this dumpster enclosure, yes. And, and, and not at all the other one. And not the existing one over here, correct? Okay, good. Doug, I, I'm done. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Janet. Whoops. Um, hi, thank you. Um, I I think this plan looks much stronger than the one um, in we first saw in December or was first shown, and I like the addition of the green space. And I I you know I I live in this area, and I just think this is um, kind of an ugly area. And some places like the Florence Bank is really trying, you know, some beautiful plantings. And then there's um, a new building coming that will have nice plantings. So I appreciate the addition of the green space and the arborvitae. I agree with um, what's been said about the triangle, like to just to have it plain grass would be sort of a loss to me. I don't know if you want to move the arborvitae, but even if you put some river birches in or some winterberry or some plantings that would just make it a prettier area to drive by and to live by. Um, possibly because I'm a gardener, I was very attentive to the green space and the idea of this is a place that people are living. And so I had some questions. I think it's great that there's an addition, a seating area for people to go to, especially by a river, which will sound good. 
when I went and visited um, the building yesterday, I noticed that there's going there are some green like small plots by each door, and I wondered is there a plan for some plantings there? It could just be herbs or some, you know, daffodils or something like something to kind of says oh you're home, and you know is there any like for each of the doors would they have some small plot of green space with some plantings that either they could plant or already have plants in them, and then when I went behind the building. There is some like sort of a murky area. It looks like a long strip along the area. I don't know if people can get access to that. Um, and there are some plantings too. So I, I feel like that might be some lost green space that with some prettier plantings could be nice to look out the back window at or um, you know, nice for the people across the way to look at. So I just wonder if there's any landscaping plan for um, the, the pieces of dirt and ground adjacent to the front and the back, back parts of this building. So for the areas, uh, I think you're talking right immediately adjacent to the building near those individual walkways. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd have to defer to ServiceNet as to what they prefer in, in those areas. Because I think that would really help create a, a good feeling of the people inside the building and for anybody around it. Kind of the um, Northampton Road property was really conscious about their landscaping and, you know, creating a, you know, it's a kind of a bleak, you know, the, you know, the, it's a bleak area of housing. And I thought any effort, even if it is sort of small efforts, I think would go a long way for people who live there and also for people who live around there. So that was one idea um, or two ideas. Um, I, I didn't understand the bus. Like, I think I, I looked briefly at some drawings this afternoon. I didn't see all the rest of the documents. Why would a bus, like a commercial, like, I mean, the size of the bus seems sort of huge. Like, it, it seemed like you were showing uh, the way a regular uh, municipal bus would turn around there versus a, you know, a van or something. So are you expecting long buses to be pulling in there or what is the need for that? So uh, as I've been told the, the residents here, most of them uh, typically don't have their own transportation. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know what size a vehicle would be, you know, uh, picking them up, but we just chose a, a standard uh, bus from the American Society of Highway Transportation with those guidelines, just as a, an illustration, I'm not saying that's exactly what will be uh, entering the site, but um, just provide an illustration of something of that similar size, um, why we needed that curb width to stay the same. So, so you're expect like you want you want to turn a pull in large enough for sort of a sixty person um, bus. I think is that what you're saying? Um, okay, so that was just not clear to me. Um, uh, Tom, Tom, is that is that how ServiceNet operates? Is it a really is it a full size intercity bus that that serves these uh, this type of population, or is it a smaller bus, kind of like a shuttle? It's can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. It's my understanding that it's uh, more of the uh, akin to a 15 passenger van uh, as opposed to a full city bus and that there were uh, concerns from my perspective, uh, uh, separate from, from uh, Ryan's, is that we do have, we will have our um, waste removal that will have to come in there. And it did seem that it would be appropriate, I, I think, and, and Ryan, you're gonna to have to correct me. I think it's currently 35 feet in width. Is and That's correct, that it, 34, it, yeah. It, it didn't seem uh, reasonable to reduce it significantly if you're going to have uh, the potential for vehicles to come in, some going to the right, some going to the left and coming out and that it just the configuration itself uh, seemed to lend itself to keeping it at the current width. And uh, we didn't, from a, just a gut feeling, it didn't seem appropriate to reduce that width for the size of the uh, parking area that we have there. That That's what I have to say. But to answer your question directly, no, we are not, uh, and I'll defer to Connor, but my understanding, we do not use uh, full-size city buses for 
I mean, we only have we only have 12 residents here, so the uh, full size city buses would not be the type of bus that would go in there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I don't I don't remember too much comment last time about from this board about reducing the width of the curb cut on Belchertown Road. Um, you know, I do remember the conversation about whether the parking spaces could be reduced in number and you've obviously addressed that. Um, go ahead, Janet. So um, I, I guess just to sum before, I'd like to see a plan, like a plan for plantings by the doorways and maybe in the back if it's gonna be a change. Um, I had questions about, I don't know, did, did people discuss like the apartments themselves, I had questions about what was the, what are the what's the square footage of each unit, and also is there an an emergency escape route, like a way to get out of the building other than the front door? Is is there are the back window? Is there a back doorway? Are there windows that people can go? Um, in case of a fire, yeah, you know, Janet, I I know that I don't I don't remember seeing any rear door, and we can certainly ask. Ryan, uh, is there is the window that's on the back of these units uh, able to be opened as an ex, as an escape? Um, <clears throat> I know there is windows at the rear of these units. Um, I'd have to defer to the architect on the width and whether or not that's considered an egress. I'm sure it, it could be made large enough to. I'm not right. not familiar enough to building code to give you guys a definitive statement on that. And then uh, do you Janet, is, is that essential to our site plan analysis? I guess I'll just put that out there. I don't know. I just I just wondered how people would get out in case of a fire. They couldn't get out the front door. OK. Uh, Chris? So um, Nate and I met with Rob Mora this afternoon, the building commissioner, and we asked that question. And Rob Mora said that there is not a requirement to have a secondary egress from these units because they're so small. So he said that the front um, entrance is all that's required for egress. All right. Thanks for filling us in about that. Janet, have, you are muted, I see. I'm not. The other, the other thing I think I just missed from missing the meeting or something, but could you just describe this program in the plan? Like who's going to come in? Um, is this permanent housing? Is this transitional housing? Who are the, who are the people being selected? Is your screening process? Just, I didn't understand, like, you know, when I looked up transitional housing on the web, it's like there's seven different kinds. And so I just wanted to know, like, what's the plan for this place? Okay. And how is it going to be managed? And then also, who are all the people in the office and what services are they providing? All right, Janet, uh, I see both Connor and Tom. You've got your hands up. So one of you can answer those questions. Connor, um, go ahead. Sure. Um, so the, the, the intent of this is truly transitional housing. Um, what we're looking at here is when someone is coming into services for ServiceNet, sometimes they don't have permanent housing. So we're looking for a temporary solution to house those individuals while they work with our housing specialists. Um, it's really going to depend on the needs of the individual, on the services that are going to be rendered at the property. Um, some individuals have different needs. Um, like I said, most of it will be around housing and, and getting individuals to and from appointments. Um, and really the individual we'll be working with would be anything from our sheltering services um, all the way through the different um, funding sources that we have, the DMH, DDS. Um, we do a lot of outreach and residential outreach services. Connor, can you also address the size of the units? Oh, sure, the size of the units, I was told by the builder today, were between 275 and 300 square feet. All right, Janet, did you have any more questions? And it's just individual, it's not families or couples and so you're so people are either coming or losing their housing and need a temporary place to stay or maybe coming off the street looking for a place to stay until they get into something more permanent is that what you're saying sure so um really where this came from is the housing market is really difficult for the individuals that we serve right now um, yeah. they could be in a permanent residence right now the landlord could increase the rent they can no longer afford the rent we have to find them another permanent permanent place to stay um, and we're really having difficulty finding them temporary housing to place them while we go and find these permanent houses. So that's really where the genesis of this project came from, really finding a place to transition these individuals into permanent housing. 
All right. Janet, are we you set? Uh, for now, thank you. Okay. Um, well, let's see. I don't see any. Oh, Johanna, there you go. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, again, I just I really appreciate this project and the intention of the applicant. Um, it's much needed, and I think um, it's going to take a corner of town that I live close to as well and just um, breathe new life into it. So I'm excited about this. Um, I had I had a couple of sets of questions. The first one was just um, clarification that the hatched area, the intention is to have that be snow storage in the winter time. Is that, that's what I read on the site plan, but I want to just verify that because some of my fellow board members have said, oh, the snook, the grass will be where the snow gets kept. But when I look at this plan, it looks like the intention is for the snow to be stored on the hatched area. Can you confirm that? Or maybe I should ask all my questions and then we can uh, do it. Sure. Uh, Ryan, do you want to answer that? Sure. So the black hatched areas are striped for no parking. That's just to define people from parking in random places that would block the flow of traffic. Um, snow can be stored at these striped areas at the end of the western lot and then also on the grassed areas over here. So that's the intent for snow storage. Perfect. Got it. Um, and then on the west end, what is the intention of the pullout at the top of the lot there? So I see, you know, uh, this right here. Yeah, that. Uh, that's so cars at the end row of the parking space uh, have room to turn the back end of the vehicle so they can uh, actually leave the parking lot. Got it. So those are no parking. It would be like signed no parking so that people can use that as a turnaround. Uh, yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. My second question set of questions just kind of runs in the continued conversation of the vegetation plan. Um, so one question is just, um, confirming that all the speed, you know, all the vegetation used is going to be native vegetation. My second question is whether there's any thought about just being intentional about creating a rain garden around the stream so that it can absorb as much runoff as possible. Um, and then whether there was any possibility to add shade trees in addition to the arborvitae. Um, so those are my questions around the vegetation plan. And then I'll, I'll just ask my other question just had to do with energy use and energy generation on site and whether there's been any consideration of putting rooftop solar. Um, and then I wanted to just ask I couldn't remember what the heating source for the units was, whether there's a heat pump unit out back or you know what that system is. I feel like we looked at the utility area in the last public meeting, but um, we haven't discussed it tonight and I don't see that in the drawings anymore. So those are my questions about the vegetation, just the, the thoughtfulness of the vegetation plan, whether there's the potential for shade trees and those questions about energy. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, we do have deciduous uh, shrubs and trees proposed around the stream bank, and that was mitigation for the conservation side of things. Currently, there's some large trees in that area, uh, but their roots are posing a hazard for this head wall, which daylights several different culverts. Um, there is a very large 60 inch culvert that conveys stormwater drainage from the city or sorry, the town through the parking lot. Um, so I would, I would uh, be hesitant to install any sort of rain garden in this area for a couple of reasons. One, there's many large subsurface pipes um, that could be in conflict with. And then two is we don't want to be infiltrating all that water um, above the head wall and compromising and adding hydraulic pressure to the head wall. Um, we are up upgrading the catch basin within the parking lot to have a deep sump hooded catch basin to give further water quality before discharging to that stream. Um, as for planting of shade trees along this, this buffer, um, I'll have to defer to service net. I know that you know more landscaping is an additional cost. Um, I guess that's at their, their discretion of what they prefer. Uh, 
All right, Johanna, are you all set? You are muted. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I just wonder whether there might be an op another opportunity to work with the town around shade trees along the road. Um, it just seems like we gotta we gotta scratch them out where we can. So I'm interested in exploring that opportunity. Um, but that's it. Thank you, uh, Ryan. I don't think you uh, reminded us about the heating source and. Uh... I, as I recall, they were mini splits, and so it would be an electrical, electrically operated or powered uh, heating system. Is that right? As far as I've been told, yes, that's correct. And the mini split exterior units, they were on the south side or the north side of the building? Um, I'd have to confirm with the, with the builder. I would think on the north side, if possible, um, that would be less visible. Um, but I, I don't have a definite answer for that. Right. Chris, do you remember if those units were uh, need to be shown in order to calculate the lot coverage? I think they should be shown. Um, I thought they were shown the on the set of drawings we had at the last meeting. I think there was discussion about where they would be, but I'm not sure that they were okay. shown or not. Okay. All right. Um, and then, sorry, I know the rooftop yeah. solar was the last question. Oh, yeah. I just wonder, it's, it yeah, seems Ryan, so Ryan, has, has, there, has there been any investigation of the, of the structural capacity of the roof uh, structure to support solar panels? And uh, no, to my knowledge, none of that, uh, no analysis is, of that has been done. And, um, you know, I'm sure Tom or Connor can speak to it. That's also an additional cost that, right. um, I mean, okay. how, how, how many panels are we looking for? What is our type of electrical output are we trying to provide? There's a lot of variables to that. Okay, Tom, I see your hand. Anything you want to comment on here? Yeah, yes, it's my understanding the mini splits are going to be on the north side of the building. They will be installed in the walls. They will not be exterior on, on, the, on the ground. Okay. And uh, as far as uh, the uh, ability to install solar, and this is a, a major undertaking by ServiceNet at this point, uh, and they really, uh, really just need to get their uh, the units in place, and then explore the uh, the feasibility of solar in the future, which would certainly would be a great. Uh, benefit for them because uh, it would, in essence, uh, take care of uh, much, if not all, of the electrical needs on, on the premises. But uh, solar, it, it's premature at this time for us to focus on the solar when we have so many other things to deal with with regard to this building. All right, thanks, Tom. Connor, I see your hand too. I just wanted to mention the solar. ServiceNet does work with a very generous private foundation that um, offsets the cost on solar. And generally after we purchase a building, they'll come out and they'll do all those assessments and we'll do the cost analysis on whether it's um, beneficial to install solar. And unfortunately at this time, we have not done that yet. All right, great. Okay, Janet, you're next. Um, I was just gonna offer that um, with the new, um, the new um, federal plan, there's a lot of more money for solar um, in terms of, you know, paybacks and also nonprofits can can get the benefits of, you know, you don't have to have a tax base to, to get the benefits. The other thing is that the, the town has trees. And so um, they're always offering us trees. So if you need, you know, you know, if you're gonna be putting some trees in, I think I would check in with the tree warden and I'm sure people, the, the tree committee would come out and dig for you from, from what I've seen. So I just think that, there's plenty of trees floating around Amherst and money for that and stuff like that. So I just wanted to offer that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Janet. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Um, Johanna's uh, comment made me think of something as well relative to the snow removal in the Northwest is, um, and I'm by no means an expert on this, so a question that anybody can answer, but if, I guess I'm not exactly clear where the snow would be piled, just with this being a guardrail. Um, and if snow is piled there, might it just all 
uh, you know, essentially melt into the neighboring property into their driveway. I, I don't, I just don't know enough about how this would happen. Where, where would the snow actually go here? Um, I didn't notice a touch basin in the immediate area, but um, just just curious if, if someone could expound upon what happens if there's a really heavy, heavy snowfall, where does the snow melt? Uh, sure. So, you know, obviously snow will be stored in these areas to the extent it, it can fit without impeding the parking spaces. Um, and then, uh, you know, a lot of in today's age, a lot of skid steers and whatnot are used to move snow around the site. Um, we have a very large area over here that I'm sure can accommodate any remaining snow on the on the uh, from the parking lot. Um, and I just want to keep in mind, let everyone know that this is this is all existing. We're not creating any new parking areas. We're reducing the amount of parking. So um, this would theoretically be an improvement over what's cur currently there now. All right. Okay. Uh, Andrew. Thank you. All right, Bruce. Um, I thought uh, the same question that Andrew had, uh, but my answer before I asked it was that um, there's so much parking here that uh, I assumed that it may be that the uh, owner would choose not to clear the whole lot through the winter. Um, I mean, unless you really needed those uh, those half dozen parking lots at the uh, at the top end or even the top four, um, you just fill the whole end of that lot with snow. My my guess is that that's what will happen because it's uh, it's this just doesn't seem to be a, a facility that is going to have constant need of all of this parking and losing four to snow storage at that western northwestern end would seem to be automatically what's going to happen here i'm just guessing but i would be surprised if i'm if i see anything different in the years to come yeah bruce that's a good point that that may uh very well may happen depending on their their needs at the site all right and is the drainage such that snow melting at that end of the lot is going to uh shed onto the Belchertown Road or where, what's the slope in this area? Sure, so <clears throat> there is a curb running along this. Uh, this parking area is pitched towards a, a catch basin at a low point right here. Uh, the rim of this catch basin is about 177 and we have a 178 contour running across here and a 179 contour up here. So this is all pitched towards that catch basin. Um, and all of this area here is also pitched towards this catch basin. So uh, the parking lot sits lower than Belchertown Road. So all the stormwater melt will stay on site. Okay, good. All right, Bruce, I see your hand. Is that a legacy? Okay, uh, Ryan, I'm gonna go ahead and ask the question that we, get, we kind of got close to earlier. Uh, if you shift up back to the Northwest end of the parking lot, um, those three striped areas are, that are, you know, uh, yeah, around the kind of north side and the west mm -hmm. end, uh, would it be a burden? Would it be an un un intolerable burden to convert those to, uh, you know, a gra grassy area with uh, asphalt curbs and and just soften that end up? And, and maybe if that was curbed and raised, your neighbor wouldn't really need the guardrail there to separate his property from yours. Uh, that's a good point. I'd have to, I don't want to speak for ServiceNet. Um, it would be up to their preference, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think uh, Bruce's comment earlier about the orientation of the striping. Uh, Andrew's comment about the snow melting. Um, you know, I think it really would soften up this area if we had a little more grass at that end. I agree. Yeah, I, I would I wouldn't see any uh, engineering constraint as to why that couldn't happen. Uh-huh. Um, all right. Um, let's see. I guess at this point I, I don't see any more hands from the board. Uh, I see one hand from the public. Uh, actually, before that, Chris, I see your hand. 
So when Nate and I met with Rob Mora this afternoon, we did come up with some questions of our own, and I'd like to ask them now if that would be okay. Sure. Um, as, as Bruce mentioned before, there's uh, some lack of coordination between the architectural drawings and the um, site drawings with regard to paving materials in particular. Trex is shown in some places and concrete is Trex is shown on the um, on one set of plans and concrete is shown on the other set of plans for stair landings and ramps. And I think that needs to be cleared up on the drawings. Um, there's also a little bit of a difference in terms of railings, where, where railings are being used and um, whether they're necessary. And there's a difference between the architectural plans and the site plans, and that needs to be um, dealt with. And what I got from the building commissioner is that you really need railings on both sides of stairways and ramps unless the architect or the site engineer can show the building commissioner that those aren't necessary. In other words, if you can make a reference to some place in the building code where those wouldn't be necessary on both sides, um, you really need to have them on both sides. The configuration of the stairs coming out of those units is different on the site plan versus the architectural plan. They're offset on the site plan so that a door swing would open and then someone would have a large area to, to stand on. Whereas on the site plan, there really isn't that kind of offset. So again, those drawings need to be coordinated. Um, we, were, we suggest <clears throat> showing an elevation view of the ramp so that we can see what the ramp looks like with the railing running alongside of it. You do have a detail of the ramp but, um, or excuse me, of the railing, but uh, we need to see what the what the slope of the ramp is going to be like. Um, we didn't see any location for bike racks. And um, our people, if they're not going to have cars, might they have bikes and might they need to park their bikes? And where would bike racks be logically located? We thought perhaps at the west end of the site, um, bike racks could be located. We also thought about EV charging stations, and I know EV cars are very expensive, and perhaps people who live here might not be able to afford an EV car at this time, but perhaps people who work here might be able to afford such a car and want to be able to charge it. So is there um, an opportunity to think about locating conduit to a particular location so that um, an EV charging station could be installed in the future? Um, another thing we talked about was the fact that there's no site lighting shown on this plan. Um, there is site lighting shown on the wall by each of the unit entrances. It's a wall sconce, but is there a need for um, lighting of the parking lot? And um, I know there's ambient, ambient lighting coming from Belchertown Road, but what is the extent of that ambient lighting? And is it necessary to have some lighting in the parking lot? So we were going to suggest um, that there might be and that the planning board might want an, a photometric plan um, showing the lighting of this uh, area. Um, we also had a question about, just like Janet did, the area between the stairs that goes into each of the units, what is that gonna be? Janet suggested plantings. It could also be, some kind of stone mulch or something, but it seems like it's an area that needs to be addressed. You know, how are you going to treat those areas? And then the last thing we thought of was the location of the HVAC units, but you're saying now that they're going to be mounted on the north wall and they won't be on the ground. So I think that question has been answered. But those were some of the things that um, we thought about. And we did come up with, if you choose to vote for this project tonight, we have some uh, conditions that might um, address those issues. So I just wanted to make sure that those were brought up. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Nate? Sure, thanks. Yeah, I was just gonna add a few things. The, um, you know, because what right now what happened is, um, if this were approved, the building inspectors, as this was going through construction drawings, there'd probably be enough inconsistencies between the site plans and what might be submitted for construction drawings that they would want to kick it back, right? Because they wouldn't be able to know what's happening with the landings or the ramps or everything that's been mentioned. And so just a few more things I think would, would be useful to show in the plan so that dumpster location and closure on the north side of the building, you know, it seems like 
I, I'm not sure, maybe this condo unit doesn't have access to it, but to show it on the plans, because right now it looks as if it would be removed and not connected to the building. So you know, that's something to show. Um, I do think HVAC and mechanicals need to be shown on plans, architectural plans, uh, as well as you know, where will all the roof vents and dryer vents and other things be shown. So you know, we were gonna suggest a condition that that be on the back of the roof or at least on the roof and not near, you know, on the soffit or near the front entries, right? So we don't, we would, we prefer not to have any bathroom vents or anything, you know, above windows or near windows or the front entries of units. Um, I think it's important to show what trees are being removed and are all the trees near the head wall and the property line, that property line being removed. There are some pretty big mature trees. And so my understanding is every tree around there is being removed. And so, you know, to a point that was raised about shade trees, I think, It'd be great to know what's really happening to have a, you know, you know, actually a, a, an, an actual landscape plan, like have it, you know, be show what's what's being removed, what's not um, some clarity on the parking lot. So, you know, will the grades of the existing parking lot tie into the front steps and the ramp nicely? Or how is that you know going to work? Because, um, you know, the application says it's going to be milled and overlaid. The plan say maybe shimmed and touched up and so we want to know is the whole parking lot actually going to is all the existing paving right a huge area going to be all milled and overlaid so the whole thing is going to be all resurfaced at once or is it just going to be kind of patchwork um i just have a few more things i do think the a photometric plan should be you know we'll, we'll probably again ask that to be a condition to come back we need to know if there's enough site lighting um we had i had emailed after the last meeting that the mass works application the town submitted and we have plans to improve route nine we're pushing the sidewalk to the property line and then that leaves very little room between the sidewalk and then the parking area on the western end of the property and so there's an existing curb there with the parking lot but it looks like maybe two or three feet and so you know it, it i think it'd be great to have some um a little bit more confirmation about what is the actual space in between property line and the and the the berm there the the curbing to the parking and what, what happens there if it is such a narrow space. Um, and then also that's an existing curb and is that gonna be replaced during paving? So is that staying or being removed? Um, and then Aaron, you know, for the Conservation Commission, they typically do not allow snow storage in the buffer area. And so I just, you know, I don't know if you'll be able to push snow right off into the proposed new green space. They often will not allow snow storage in a buffer area. I just wanna make sure that Aaron is also comfortable with the new sub pump discharge area because uh, that could change you know some some siting um uh Nate, and I think are you saying that the concom did not approve this plan they have not yet all right so i think aaron has uh communicated with the applicant and maybe ryan i think you know um so I think some of, I think some of this is probably okay, but I know often a standard condition is no snow room, you know, storage in a in a um, in a buffer area, and depending on I don't know if it's like grandfather or how it works, you know, a discharge can still remain in the in a buffer area as well. So I, I don't know those details or regulations as well, but I just um, you know, and I think you're proposing a chain link fence on top of the head wall, and right now at one point there was a vinyl fence, and now there's a failing fence, and so just to you know, be great to have some kind of detail or some, a little bit more um, to know what's happening there. Is it, you know, is it the head wall is being rebuilt possibly and then the stumps are gonna remain and then there'll be a chain link fence. And so, you know, it sounds like a lot but I feel like some of it could just be either annotations on a plan or the consistency between both architectural and site plans would really help. Um, you know, Rob Moore, the building commissioner was saying that you know, like I said, for instance, his staff would come and look at this if this were submitted and they would probably put a pause on it because, you know, all, you know, there's a lot of inconsistencies or not a lot of clarity on some of those aspects. Thanks, Nate. Chris or Nate, do you know when the CONCOM is scheduled to approve this? Typically, we don't, we don't feel the need to vote until CONCOM has approved something. The CONCOM is um, going to take this up on the 11th. I think the last time they had a meeting, they didn't have quorum, so they couldn't um, deal with anything, but they're going to take it up on the 11th. My conversations with Aaron 
uh, Jacques, the wetland administrator, had been that she was more or less okay with what is being shown on the plans, but the, the planning board might want to wait until the CONCOM actually votes. So that's up to you. Well, I, I mean, I'm I'm troubled by this the same the inconsistencies between drawings. I feel like the the kind of level of development of the drawings has been a little lower than we're accustomed to and make it difficult to understand what's really going on. So if, if that could be improved, I think a delay, a continuation would be a good idea. Nate, uh, your hand is up. Oh, okay, thank you. Janet. Um, I, I was going to suggest that we continue because, you know, given that the architect has been ill, Holiday's architect has been ill and now has a death in the family. And, you know, it seems like we have a lot of little details that need to be remedied. And if we're going to try to address what we'd like to see in conditions and we're kind of drafting them here, this meeting will go on forever. And I don't think it's going to be helpful. I think it'd be faster if we just continued to another meeting, saw the finals, you know, made some tweaks and, and went into a, a vote. Okay. I also really don't want to vote before the concom. So, all right, sounds like you might be ready to make a motion at some point, uh, Bruce. Oh, I was going to say exactly what Janet said. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, Rob and uh, the planning staff have had the opportunity that we haven't, which is to look more closely at these drawings. I saw a couple of things, and then Nate and uh, Chris listed a whole lot of things that are little things. So and, and the need for additional drawings, and so I I I absolutely agree with Janet. Uh, I agree also with with you about the concom. Let's let them make their decision. And the only reason I kept my hand up was because the one thing I'd like to add to this is, uh, um, if uh, and I would move move to continue the hearing, but I would like that the uh, applicant um, provide us with the uh, amended documentation. Um, let's say um, uh, midweek uh, or, or before the end of the week prior to our meeting so that we have a day or two to look at this. Um, otherwise, we're in the same kind of position of having to rush through this and not really know what's, whether, whether what we've asked for has happened. So I'd move that we continue the meeting and I'd uh, ask that the applicant uh, provide the additional documentation uh, at the end of the business week prior to our meeting. I guess uh, we have to continue to a date uh, and time certain, don't we? Yeah, so my guess you, is you could manage that if you wouldn't. It'll and probably I'll just... be January 18th would be the next meeting. Uh, Chris, uh, is there a time we ought to use? 6.35 or? I think 6.35 would be fine, but I would want to have a nod from Pam that that's okay because Pam is my conscience mm -hmm. and keeps me on the straight and narrow. Um, does... Is that a good for the architect or the um, service net? Is that too fast? Uh, let's see. Pam, uh, why don't you go ahead and answer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chris's question about the time? So Chris, we do potentially have a solar presentation being provided on January 18th. I don't have a time for that, so I don't know if you would want to use 635 or if you thought Martha Hanner might want to be first. Well, normally we put the public hearings first and we have other things afterwards. So I think we should probably make the public hearing first. First, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, uh, Connor or Mr. Miranda uh, is a continuation to the 18th, would that work with your consultant's schedules? I can't say for certain that it would, but I would like to have it continue to the 18th. And if our consultant is not able to do that, uh, give a, a letter to the board saying, asking you to continue it to the following meeting. But we do have, um, we do have commitments to the seller on this. And so we really are doing our best to move this forward as quickly as possible. Our architect is uh, Tim Nyart, who's been working on this, has been uh, very cooperative with us. And I just can't answer for him because uh, his mother recent, I think within the past couple of days has passed and he has some family commitments surrounding that. 
Um, if so, if that works, I would like to continue it to the 18th. And if we're not able to get our paperwork to you in time, we would notify you and just ask that you open and close the hearing and continue it to your next available date. All right. Um, all right, so we have a, and we'll, a and motion we'll on the and we'll give you an answer. We'll give Christine an answer on that uh, the Thursday before uh, your next meeting. So that way she'll, she'll have a heads up on that and be able to advise you accordingly. All right, and do you think you, I think you probably ought to also check and make sure you think you can deliver the sort of improved right. or revised drawings in a little more time before our next meeting. Yes, yeah, so we'll all be by that Thursday, yes. Okay. I think that I think that that's uh, that may have been what Bruce asked for. I know someone asked for uh, right. early, reasonable reasonable time during that week. Right, and and I guess uh, are you willing to entertain some of the comments you've heard this evening about maybe uh, articulating some of the landscape a little bit differently? In terms of the uh, relocation of the arborvitae, I would say yes. Uh, I have to defer to uh, just historically my experience with uh, the type of uh, individuals that are going to be in this uh, in this location. They'll be coming and going, and I don't know how really how practical it is to have um, landscaping uh, to be maintained near each of the unit entryways. It, uh, I think. It, I, it's not as if you're going to have people there uh, for extended period of time that would take an ownership interest in this. And uh, it, it's, to me, it doesn't seem practical. I think a better description of what the area will be uh, is, is probably more appropriate. And uh, we can discuss that and propose, uh, propose um, uh, keeping it impervious, excuse me, pervious material. So there's no, we were not going to have any more uh, impervious area uh, through there, but I, I have to defer to Connor. But it, uh, my sense is that uh, to provide landscaping near the building is is just not practical based upon the um, the clientele that's going to be there. All right, uh, Tom, you haven't had a chance to speak this evening. I was going to second Bruce's motion to continue. Okay. All right. Thank you, Tom. So we have a motion on the floor. Uh, by the way, uh, let's see. At one point, I started to offer public comments, and the hand, the person who was had their hand raised, is no longer in the meeting. However, I, I think I should at this point offer. Uh, the two other members of the public who are here, uh, do either of you wish to make any comments on this project this evening? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands for that. Uh, so board members, we can go back to our motion on the floor to continue the hearing to January 18th. And I believe we did agree on 635 as being uh, a workable time for us to yeah. incorporate into the motion. Um, if there's no further comments from the board, we can go ahead into our vote. Okay, why don't we go ahead and do that? Continue to January 18th. Bruce. Uh, approve. All right, Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And I'm an I as well. It's unanimous. Six favors and six votes in favor and one absent. All right. Mm. So the time now is 7.58. We're almost exactly at our customary time for a break. Um, why don't we all turn off our cameras and mute ourselves and come back at 8.05. Thank you. And thank you to the ServiceNet team.
All right, time is 8.05, and if you're back at your desk or wherever you join us from, please turn on your cameras. All right. Looks like we have one more member to return. Doug, would you mind if I asked a question at this time? I don't mind, Chris, not in the least. I um, just wanted to ask Andrew, uh, I've kind of lost track of things over the last couple of months, um, but I, I know that you were not here on December 7th and um, if you have watched the video of the December 7th meeting, you'd be eligible to vote So um, on this case. So I would encourage you to watch the video for December 7th, then you can vote. Janet already sent me an email that she watched the video, and so she is eligible to vote. That's just a reminder, and I know I'll both, I would forget if I didn't mention it now. Thank you. Okay, Johanna, are you there? Okay, great. Sorry to call you out there. <clears throat> I just got back. <laughs> All right. Okay, so the time is 8.07 and we'll continue with our uh, agenda. Uh, item four is old business topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance. Do we have any, Chris or Pam? No. I'm seeing you both shake your heads no. Okay. What about new business? Equally unanticipated. No. Nope. Okay. Uh, item six uh, Form A, AR subdivision applications. Anything? You have we do have one. Okay. Chris? We you didn't include that? it in your packet because we weren't sure that we'd be able to show it to you tonight because the town engineer hadn't reviewed it, but Pam <clears throat> made magic happen and the town engineer did get a chance to review this. Um, <clears throat> this is a property that um, was owned by Gordon Fletcher Howell, and I don't know if many of you will remember him, but he was a person who had been a Vietnam War veteran, and he came back and he was traumatized by his time in the war, and he made an effort to reach out to other veterans and help them with their traumas that were similar. But he also became a landscape designer and a landscape contractor, and he had this marvelous property out on Leverett Road that was just beautiful. And someone bought it and carved it up into a lot of pieces, hoping to sell each piece to build a house on. But now someone else has bought it and wants to combine all the pieces. And I'm really happy about that. So I probably shouldn't have prejudiced you in that way. But um, <laughs> what, what we're trying to do here, what the applicant is trying to do is take these six parcels and combine them back into one parcel that they had been they had all been contiguous mm -hmm. when Gordon Fletcher Howell owned mm -hmm. this property. So um, in, in my opinion, there's no uh, subdivision um, control um, examination needed here. And so what you would be asked to do is to authorize Doug to um, sign this plan, this ANR plan, acknowledging that um, no subdivision control process is required. 
And this is, is this All the right. plan? Is this the A&R plan, Pam? This, this is the A&R plan. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yep. All right. Um, Six slots. Anybody have any questions or comments? Janet. Um, I am happy to, to vote, give the nod to this, but do you have a question, Chris? Um, was this divided up several times? Because I thought that six lots, dividing to six lots would trigger the subdivision control and you need to have like an access road and all that good stuff. Or was this just chopped up in pieces? It does, it does, it is a terrible looking situation right now. It's good to rectify it. Well, if if it had a road in it, it would probably require subdivision approval, but it had three flag lots. Um, mm -hmm. It was divided a few different times, and some of that is shown on the map that Pam just showed us preceding. The, um, the GIS map shows that uh, the turquoise lines are the latest lines that exist, but the underlying dotted lines are a precursor to the um, turquoise mm -hmm. lines. But um, the plan shows that there were three flag lots in a row on the north side of the site, one flag lot um, on the south side, and you're allowed to have as many as three flag lots in a row, and then two frontage lots. So there, there were mm -hmm. essentially four flag lots here and two frontage lots, and now they're combining it into one. But there would not have been a requirement to have subdivision because you're allowed to have the three flag lots uh, contiguous with each other, no more than three. And then you could, of course, have the last one down below, and you're allowed to have frontage lots, you know, sort of any old time in Massachusetts. Um, so this uh, would not have required a subdivision road, which is what triggers the subdivision control law. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Janet. Bruce. Um, I, I hope you could indulge me a moment here, uh, because I want to ask a question about the the, the configuration that we are now giving, uh, uh, we'll, we'll give uh, Doug approval to sign away. But the, uh, this, uh, the curiosity that I have, this bears remarkable similarity to the Pine Street co-housing uh, configuration that I uh, invented. Um, uh, about 30 plus years ago and, and at the time made Bob Mitchell cry because it was so difficult and there were all sorts of uh, arguments about it and ultimately I think the following uh, after we were approved Sharon Josie's uh, when she was chair of the planning board uh, uh, initiated a, a move to limit the length of flag poles in order to prevent anybody doing what we did again um, because although I guess people generally thought that we we did a nice thing, they they were horrified that we were able to do it. Uh, and the, the 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 mechanism to restrict doing what we did again was to limit the length of the pole. So the question I have, uh, Chris, is this pole that's on the uh, north side here, this very long pole, is that? Uh, uh, is that still uh, that's that doesn't exceed whatever the new pole limit that was enacted in the mid 90s that's uh, that th th this was this was this was acceptable um is my question yes it is okay. acceptable there's a section in um well there's article 7 which talks about the limitation on the um, length of an individual driveway, and I think it's 1,200 feet, but we know that Article 7 also has a paragraph at the end that says that any part of Article 7 can be uh, waived or modified for reasons of, mm. uh, what are they, reasons of safety, aesthetics, or site design. So the, although there is that limitation, it is possible to get around it. You also have, there's also something else in here about if you exceed the length of a um, driveway, if the driveway is longer than 1200 feet that you can get um, permission from the planning board to allow it to be longer than um, 1200 feet. In any event, what I wanted to say is that if any of these lots that are flag lots were to be developed, they would have to go through a process with the Zoning Board of Appeals 
to permit them to be developed as a flag lot. So these lots, even though they are configured as flag lots, haven't gone through the process with the Zoning Board of Appeals yet. And yeah. then, you know, the subject of driveway length and all of that would have come into question or conversation. So okay. is that a good answer to your question? Uh, it, 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 it basically, it says what I thought had been prohibited by the town uh, no longer seems to have been prohibited or I misunderstood what was done. So this is helpful to me just generally when I'm uh, when people are talking about where I live. I, uh, that's, that's thank you very much. I'm sorry to have uh, taken. It was helpful to me. Okay, Bruce. All right, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, I guess what we usually do with these ANRs is ask, uh, rather than doing a formal roll call vote, we ask uh, if there's a consensus or, or whether anyone objects to my going ahead and signing this. So uh, do we have anyone who would not support that? Seeing a lot of heads shaking, no. Uh, so I think we're okay, Chris. If I can interpret the the the, the, the tenor of the room, um, okay. So uh, that was our A and R for this evening. Um, Pam, I assume we don't have another one. No, that was the only one, and okay. I'm not aware of any new ZBA applications to discuss tonight. But Chris okay, may. All right. So we. That takes care of item seven on our agenda. Uh, just as a time check, I see 8.16 is the time. Um, then the next item was our uh, upcoming SPP, SPR, and SUB applications. Chris, uh, anything you wanna give us a preview of? Um, I do wanna go back to ZBA applications because there was one that came in that sneaked by Pam. Um, hmm. and. I reviewed it today with somebody else in the department, and it is a um, <clears throat> property up on, I think it's Old Town Road and North Pleasant Street, property that has a duplex on it now, and the owners of the property want to add a duplex to that property, so it would end up with two duplexes on it, and um, so there would be four units and a total of eight bedrooms, and that has just been um, brought to us. We haven't gone over the application with the building inspector, building commissioner yet, but I suspect that he will um, steam it to be complete because it looks complete to me. And then that would be filed and um, the Zoning Board of Appeals would be reviewing it soon, probably in February. And what what zone is that in? My guess is it's RN, but I'm not sure. I don't remember. All right. And that kind of thing is allowed uh, with special permit? It is. Yep. OK. Janet? How, I'm sorry. Can you say the location again? And how big is the lot? I don't know. I don't remember how big the lot is, but it's at the corner of Old Town Road and North Pleasant Street. So it's in the... Um, neighborhood that's just north of the university it's the neighborhood that has a valley i think it's called oh no i, I better not say <laughs> but it's it's just north of the university the uh, former um planning board chair lives in that neighborhood christine gray mullen so if you know oh, where yeah. she lives it's up in there <clears throat> okay but has that been done before it has been um there has to be a declaration by the board that the use is complementary. Okay. A section in the beginning of um, of the use table, the beginning of the introduction to the use table that says you can't have more than one principal use on the site unless the board um, declares it to be a complementary use. So. Okay. So board members, is that something we would like to have a presentation on? Or can can we just leave it to ZBA to take care of that? Bruce, I see your hand. 
Yes, this was a question. Uh, it seems to me that this is uh, at least similar, if not the same, perhaps similar be, uh, to the to the property to, to the to the zoning to the last time we asked to look at a ZBA application. Actually, also on North Pleasant Street, but in that case, it was up in the North Amherst Centre, um, and it was uh, Michael Holden's property. It has a duplex, and they were building a second principal use which was a, uh, another dwelling, a single family dwelling in this case. So uh, Chris, it's, is, it, is it exactly similar to that? Or is the fact that there, we're talking about two duplexes instead of one duplex and a, and a single family, does that make a difference? Well, in the case of Michael Holden, um, he was going to live on the site. He was gonna live in the single family house and rent out the duplex. In the case of this um, added duplex, nothing is going to be owner occupied it's all going to be um, non-owner occupied um, duplexes so that's different yes except that the zoning board uh, did not condition owner occupancy on michael holden's uh, application when they reviewed and proved it although the planning board did recommend i know the zoning board um, put that condition on yeah yeah uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm not putting my hand up to say I think we should look at it, but I'm. I'm not averse to it if others are interested. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Janet. So, I, I'm just curious about the how big it is because I know that in the RN you can build multiple units depending on the size of the lot, and so, you know, if it's two acres or it, I'm just wondering if it's meeting that requirement or it's going to exceed what's allowable, but I, I don't know if we have enough information right now. Well, don't you think the ZBA would look at that pretty carefully? No, I'm not, I'm not questioning them. I'm just saying if it, if it's much, if it's an extra, if only three units are allowed given the acreage and they want four, you know, that's kind of a, um, a march and sort of a changing of the neighborhoods so that would be more interesting to me. I see. Chris. So the way the building commissioner has been interpreting the bylaw um, is that you would have um, a certain amount of property for the first dwelling unit. And then for each additional dwelling unit, you would only need the um, required lot acreage, lot size for each additional dwelling unit. So I think is say it's in the RN district. I'm just guessing that it is. You need 20,000 square feet for the first unit. And then for the next three units, you need 6,000 square feet for each additional unit. So um, that means that you don't need two times 20 plus six for each additional unit, according to the way the building commissioner interprets the bylaw. All right. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I haven't heard anyone say they really want to see this. <laughs> Um, so, and uh, sounds, uh, I'm not seeing any strong reaction from Bruce or Janet, because you've talked most about this. Um, Nate, I see your hand. Yeah, I mean, I, I have it up on the map, but just when you guys were looking at, I can share a screen. When you were talking about the lot area, I, I, it's just enough for three units, or maybe four three additional units, right? So the primary and then the three additional. So if this, if my screen is visible, it's this property right here on the corner and it has a, almost a, you know, um, a large lot. So it's almost nine tenths of an acre. So I guess it has just enough for a primary unit and then three units. And the, um, you know, it's a historic house, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. And this is the view, this, this is the house. We'll get rid of the glare. Um, you know, yep. here's the house right here. So it's right across from, you know, Mark's Meadow entrance or what was, and then the parking lot. So, um, you know, it's, it's been a two family for a while and a non-owner occupied two family for a while. All right, thanks, Nate. Yeah, yeah. it's All like right. they, I, we'd have to have a survey, but they squeak in by a hundred, hundred square feet, Chris, to be able to do that. All right. Greater. Bruce, I I just uh, when Nate put his hand up, uh, put his map up. Uh, 
it seemed to me that uh, this is something that the zoning board are going to be able to handle quite nicely. It's, it's, uh, it's knowing where it is, driving past it frequently, and uh, it's, I'm, I, I'm, I'm confident that the zoning board don't need our help. Okay. They don't need a recommendation from us that they may or not may not follow. <laughs> okay, so I guess that'll that'll that takes care of the ZBA applications, Chris. I can't think of any um, planning board applications. They are out there in the wings, but I can't think of any. Okay. All right. Uh, time check, it's 8.25. Uh, the next item, upcoming SPP, SBR, and SUB applications. Anything you want to mention? No. All right. All right, uh, Planning Board Committee and Liaison Reports. Uh, Bruce, any progress with PVPC? No, I was, uh, did you rattle Buckelman's case? I did, and he, he positively, you know, responded, but I haven't seen anything come from since then. He didn't like me. I don't know why. I'm a nice guy, but uh, anyway, it's too bad. Okay. Andrew, anything on CPEC? Yeah. Um, so uh, since I was last on, there, we had a couple of meetings that did our voting on the proposals um, and put together a, 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 a proposal for town council it's taking the 15 projects uh which you may remember it, there's like eight million dollars worth of ask um so far exceeding you know what we have and what we've normally seen um called that down to uh 11 don't quote me on the numbers but like 11 projects a couple of minor differences being uh, one project which is uh, zion church in north amherst um they weren't sort of fully prepared for their presentation. And what we've done is set aside some money and cash reserves to be able to address that um, and give them some time to come back to us. Um, big ones, Crocker Farm Elementary School Playgrounds, that we pulled that off the list. Um, that was gonna be about 450,000 for, uh, for those improvements. Um, I say we actually, the applicant uh, pulled that out of consideration. And then the Fort River Fields project, uh, that was a $3 million ask. And we instead uh, agreed to bond 700,000 of that. Um, and that that would be contingent upon the school override passing. But end of the day, lots of haircuts, a couple of big projects have some major, some major changes, but we're able to get through and, um, and, and do so with some cash reserves to spare. So I would say just kudos. I know uh, Sonia is retiring. She uh, she and Sean did a fantastic job uh, getting us something to work with. So uh, really happy with how that, that played out. And Andrew, am, am I right? You Your committee makes a recommendation to town council and they have to uh, uh, approve or vote to adopt that. Have That's they done right. so? Um, not that I'm aware of, but um, uh, yeah, we met sort of right before the holidays. I don't know when town councils most recently met. Okay, so, but you've made your recommendations. Good. Yes. Okay. Uh, Tom, DRB. Uh, oh, can I ask actually, a quick Johanna, question? I see your hand. I was just curious, and Andrew, it's fine if you don't know the answer to this, but do you know whether town council has... Do they just vote up or down on your proposal, or do they have line item veto? Of it's 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 an up or down. Yeah. So they 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 can't. Um, yeah. Essentially, it would be up or down. So what we what we put forward, um, they can't make recommend different recommendations with the money. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, Tom. Nothing to report this week. All right. Janet for Solar Bylaw. Um, we have a meeting on Friday, and we're going to be getting a talk on battery safety by um, uh, Chris Bascom, who's, um, I feel like he might be the assistant fire chief um, of our fabulous fire department. Um, and the battery safety issue is really um, ever-changing and kind of concerning and hopefully getting better. 
And then we're also talking about a, a solar bylaw survey being prepared by a consultant that will go out to the town to figure out um, what the town folk think about positives and negatives and where they'd like to site solar, what they would like to be protected and things like that. So that's all um, kind of in draft. And so at some point, I'd be happy to send that to the planning board members if they want to see that, um, what that survey will look like and make comments on it. That'd be, I could do that. Uh, does it feel like your group is on track to complete your work in May, I think was your original deadline? I don't think so, frankly. I think um, I think everybody's sort of agreeing that it's going to go longer. So, And how does that tie in with the charge from town council? Is, um, is council I, okay with I, that or? I, I, I'm not really in, tied into sort of town council stuff, but I think that um, Chris might be better able to answer this. I know that um, we're looking to the planning department to provide drafts and I know that we've lost some people, but um, I think, you know, we haven't talked about it that much, but things are going slower. And I think that, you know, May is optimistic, but we should still aim for it, I suppose, right, Chris? Mm, I think we'll still aim for it. But in fact, the um, town manager is the person who appointed this board, this working group so um he would be the one i believe who would be able to extend their time um, okay good mm -hmm. okay great and chris anything on crc so the crc is still working on the um rental registration bylaw the new rental registration bylaw which is much more robust than the existing one will require more inspections and um more fees and more of everything so um, but they they have not um, completed their work on that but you'll probably be becoming familiar with it at some point um the other thing let's see what else they they are putting forth a um well actually i shouldn't say they are two counselors and i think i mentioned this last time um are putting forth a proposal to change the bylaw having to do with duplexes they're adding a definition for triplexes and they're changing or they're they're hoping to change the way townhouses and apartments are permitted throughout town so they're hoping to make it more possible for people to build um these multi-unit buildings and um they're going to be presenting that to the town council fairly soon, I think, if not by the end of January, then sometime in February, and then it will be referred to the planning board and the CRC for uh, public hearings. And Chris, remind me, with a bylaw proposal that originates with town councilors, uh, do we have the latitude to edit and adjust it as we hold our hearings and deliberate or are we does it is it simply up or down we adopt we recommend it or not no i think you can make recommendations to change it um doesn't mean that they'll take your recommendations but you can make recommendations if i can get a hold of the latest version of it i can probably send it to you in, in advance so you can at least become familiar with it um, i'm not sure that i have the latest version but i'll try to find that Okay, uh, Janet, I do see your hand. So Chris, is that just changes in the permitting pathway or is it increasing the density per per acre? Like we just we just saw we could put four units on an acre in RN. Would it be changes that way or is it just the permit pathway for a, tri a triplex or a townhouse? It's the permitting pathway and the description of the type of um, dwelling unit that it creates, yep. But no changes in the dimensional requirements, as far as I know. All right. Uh, I guess, is that all from CRC? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess the next item, it's 834, report of the chair. I don't really have much of a report, although I would like to say that I am hoping in the coming months that we can have some conversation about uh, areas of town that we might be able to 
upzone and allow denser housing than now exists. Uh, uh, you know, I have some ideas about that and, and would like to bring them to you. And um, so I hope uh, people would be willing to have that on, the, on, on one of our agendas in the upcoming months. Um, that's really all I had to say. Um, report of staff, Chris, anything? I just wanted to um, say that we are in the process of um, reaching out to people to get them to apply for the two planner positions that we have open and that I really appreciate um, Pam and Nate, who are the, the planning department along with me currently, and we're doing a lot of work and um, hoping that we can manage to keep all the balls in the air. So mm -hmm. uh, anyway, we, we will be interviewing soon. We have, a, I think we have seven applicants, if I'm not mistaken. So that's all I have to report. All right, great. Uh, anyone have anything else you want to add before we adjourn? All right, time is 8.35. This has been a relatively fast meeting. Uh, maybe we can start off on a good, in a good place this year. All right, thank you for your time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Happy Goodbye. New Year. Good night. Happy New Year. Thank you, Pam. Should we stop recording?